Well, amen. Jeremiah chapter 18. I found most of the time things don't go on my right in my life because my life is not in His hands as it should be. Amen. Some things I think are right are not necessarily right. But when my when my life is in His hands, God's hands as it should be, things tend to change. Amen. It seems like the sorrow I go through is worth it. It seems like the the pleasure that one has is right and it's pure. So Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6, uh, maybe over the next couple, three weeks, we'll look at this. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, has seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. This whole marring and remaking and so on is an excellent picture of, of what Christ would do when He was rejected of the Jews and the uh, Gentile church took over. By the way, the church is the Israel of God. Um, but I want to look at this as God's relationship to His people. God uses a lot of images to teach His relationship with us. One, He'll be a shepherd and we are our sheep. Amen. Telling us that we are protected and provided for led by His Word. Sometimes He uses a husband and wife relationship, showing that we are loved without condition. Amen. Um, that we are to submit to Him. Sometimes He shows us that He is the Father and we are His children, and that we're constantly under His care. Well, get a hold of that this morning. We're constantly under the Father's care. Right now. But here we see... Another relationship of God the Father and us, and that is the potter and the clay. And what he's teaching us here is to be completely submitted to him as he conditions us. That, that's what we're learning here. To be completely submitted to God as he conditions us. You see, God didn't just save us from our sins just so we could go to heaven and avoid hell. As a matter of fact, John 15, 5, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. God saved us to bring forth fruit. God saved us to be a vessel that would honor Him. And the only way we can honor God is to be made of God. We, we have nothing to offer God. Not at all. It's only in Christ that we can honor God. So I want to look at the potter's house for, um, like I said, maybe a couple, maybe three weeks, uh, just depending on how things are going. But this morning I want to cover verses 1 through 3, and I want to talk about the potter's purpose. What his purpose is in our lives. Again, let me read him. He says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. The potter has a singular purpose. He plans to take clay, and then from that clay, produce vessels. Amen? He wants to make vessels... That will reap a profit. That's why they do that. That's why they make these vessels and they paint them and they fire them and all these things is so they can make turn a profit. That's what God wants from us. Amen. He wants us to, to turn a profit, to be found useful, and to bring honor unto Him. 
and the pieces that he manufactures are intended to be used by himself and others. Amen. And the interesting thing is that God takes the worst and turns it into the best. God does that. I mean, think about clay for a second. Uh, it is mud. It is mud. Have you ever heard the message, I don't know if we recorded it or not, from camp meeting a couple of years ago, and the kids still make fun of it, uh, was when I preached that you're dirt. You're dirt. Amen? Uh, you wives have seen ring around your husband's collars, right? That's sweat. And guess what he's sweating? Dirt. You know why he's sweating dirt? Because he's dirt. Amen? We're dirt. That's what we are. I like that testimony. Brother Walt stood up and said, uh, I know of all the people that have sinned in this church, I'm the worst. That's right, sir. You're dirt. You're clay. As we all are. I mean, we got to get a hold of this idea that how in the world do we think we can do anything outside of Christ when all we are is a big chunk of dirt? I mean, it's the worst. I mean, what can be worse? It's dirt. Amen? So, I want to show you in the potter's purpose to make us vessels that will bring, that will turn a profit, that will bear fruit, and that will glorify Him. There's two things that He uses. The first thing is His influence. And the second thing is His implements or His tools. How He does it. And we're going to see some things that a potter has to go through, and we're going to see a pretty good picture between God and us. I, I hope anyways. That's my intention. But first of all, let's notice God's influence. Let me just say to you right now, there is absolutely no way that clay can be brought from the ground by itself. You can't just be clay. The clay cannot get up and crawl to the potter's house. The potter has to go get the clay. He has to go choose it out. He finds it. Amen? And the thing is, it's a pretty lofty goal if you think about it, that the potter would come down and choose some clay, and that clay is a material that, quite frankly, leaves much to be desired. I mean, look around. Look at yourself. Look at who we actually are, what we are. Look at how easily we can fail and stumble and get bitter and be tempted and fall. Look at all this. But yet God, by His influence, He has a what we would appear as, as a lofty goal to take us from being dirt and clay to being used in His hands for His glory and His honor and His benefit. And it's all done by His influence. We can't do it on our own. Just if that clay could get up and go up there and form itself on the wheel, then we, we could be saved and we could please God. But it takes God's influence. Now let me tell you something. When He goes out and He finds clay, as you find it, it's not very suitable for use. You can't just go dig up clay and work it and it's a vessel. Amen? It's not very suitable. It has to be dug out of the ground. Then it has to be brought to the vicinity of the pottery. And it's allowed to weather for weeks. It sits out and weathers. Then the dry material after weeks is dumped into a cement lined tank or a wooden trough and covered with water. Now, where do you dry it out and then you cover it with water? When the lumps have softened, they're stirred into the water until all of the lumps have disintegrated and there's a thin, slimy mud left there that's called slip. Now, 
in the coastal cities, the potteries are all near the sea because the seawater is considered best for the slipping process. Just interesting. So look at all that's gone on. We don't even have clay on the wheel yet, and look what's gone on. The slip is drawn off into settling tanks, and all the stones and lumps from the slip are left behind. When the clay is finally settled, the water is drawn off, and it's a plastic-like material that you work by treading on it with your feet. Well, there's a whole lot goes on before we have a vessel. The prepared clay is finally packed away and allowed to stand another six months before you use it. Packed usually in some kind of a wrap. During which time the quality, especially the plasticity, improves the clay. What a perfect picture of God's influence on a sinner's life. You know, so many times we get confronted with salvation and people will say, well, let me say my prayer and get saved or let me go forward and let me end this altar call or whatever you got to do. Shake the preacher's hand, whatever you got to do. And many of us think that God started influencing us when we heard the message that day at church. And that is, you can mark it down, when you hear the gospel, that is when God starts influencing you. But I'm going to tell you, the day you got saved is not the first day of influence. Just think back in your life about that. Jesus made it very clear that no man can come to the Father except the Father which sent me draw him. That means it takes God's influence. And just like God has to work the ground. Amen. I still love the parable of the sower. It's probably my favorite illustration of men's hearts. You have the hardened ground which it, it refuses to be worked. It's trampled on. You can't put seed in that. Birds take it right on up. You'll be preaching to somebody like that and they'll be going, yeah, yeah, whatever. Amen. You'll try to witness to somebody like that. Uh huh, that's nice. Oh, I've already got that. I'm good. Then you'll find those people that, man, you, you give them the gospel and boy, right away they respond. That's amazing. Amen. But they don't last very long because there's rocks in the soil. Hadn't been cleared out yet. And of course, today we live in churches where the preachers are always trying to pull out the rocks. That's not how it works. God has to pull those rocks out. It's God's influence. Then some of them grow a little bit longer, but then they get choked by the thorns, the cares of this world. They want to go back to their bikinis. They want to go back to their sports. They want to go back to their way of living. They want to go fishing every now and then on Sunday instead of be at church. They don't want to wear what a Christian wears anymore. They don't want to believe like a Christian believes anymore. And it's being choked by thorns. See, the problem is, is there was no influence. But then God tells us through Christ when He says, but the good ground are they. That, that when they put the, when the seed goes into the ground, there's no rocks, there's no thorns, and it's well watered. And out of that comes depth for roots, and then it grows and bears much fruit. And you say, well, how did that heart become like that? How can I have a good heart this morning, preacher? It's only through the influence of God that a person can have a good heart. Our hearts are woefully dark, and they're full of rocks. And they're hard. And they're by the wayside. And they're full of thorns. So how do you think that seed got into that heart? God had to prepare the ground. Amen. God had to go in and He had to moisten that ground up and start breaking it up. God, and by the way, the first time you heard the gospel, it probably sounded profane to you. Amen. And then God had to go in and as He's trying to plant the seeds, He's having to pull the rocks out. And those all those things that block your mind from understanding the Gospel, He starts pulling it out. 
The gospel itself does the work. It's not necessarily the preacher. I'm so thankful that people will say, man, preacher, I appreciate you because you make it very clear and people can understand how to be saved. That's true. I get that. We, we need to, we need to use the word of God. We need to be as clear as possible, but it's God that's pulling the rock out. It's not the preacher. God is influencing that heart. God is now starting to pull the thorns out. The next thing you know, that sinner starts realizing, you know what? This sin life ain't cutting it. This sin life ain't doing it for me. There is a God and I'm in trouble with it. Well, don't you know God will influence that heart? Just like He influenced the clay. He had to come out to where the clay was. He had to choose the clay and had to do all that it took to make it pliable and to make it workable. This is a wonderful picture of, of those that are lost in sin. We are worthless to God in our natural condition. However, He is able to see the vessels that we can become. You know, some people won't get saved because they think, I can never live this Christian life. It's just too hard. It's too much. No, my friend, God does it. God saves you. God changes you. God cleans you. God's going to raise you up one day. God takes you to heaven. It's all about God and His influence. Amen? Without the influence of the potter, their clay would never be in the potter's house. He begins the process that will bring us to a place of usefulness in His service. He digs us out. He washes us off. He cleans us. He dries us. That's all the process of repentance. By the way, funny thing is, I've got to go back to it. We're made of the same clay we're talking about here. We are made of that same dirt. How can we ever think that we can do anything for our Creator without His influence? We can't. Not one sinner will ever be saved without the influence of God. Let God work on that heart. We don't force people to get saved. We don't try to put them in a corner and get them to say that prayer. I'm telling you, shame on most of the Baptist preachers I've ever met because that's exactly what they do. They try to pull the rocks out. They try to get the sticks out. They try to trample it down and water it and dry it and, and all these things and cure it. No, my friend, only God does that. It is His influence. It's the Gospel being preached. I think it's high time for preachers to understand that their business is very simple. Preach the Gospel and let God do the work. Amen. So, we see the potter's purpose is to have vessels that will honor Him. That's what He wants. That's what He gets. And number one, it's by His influence. Now, just for sake of alliteration, I I also want to point out His implements. The tools He uses. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to be using a lot of figurative language here and but it's only to support biblical concepts. Amen? See, the potter uses several implements to bring the clay to a place where it's suitable. See, it has to come from where it is to get to where it's finally sold in the market. It has, it has to get there. Now, we know it's all done by his, his influence, but he used several tools. The first one is he uses a shovel. That's the tool he uses to dig the clay from the earth. Amen. And have you ever uh, suck, sunk a shovel down in where it's real wet, where it wouldn't perk, and you know, and you push down in there, and, and you go to try to pull a big lump of clay out? You ever try to do that? Did you ever notice that as you're pulling on it, that thing goes, and that earth tries to keep a hold of it? How that clay keeps just trying to stay right there. Hey, man. So he's using this shovel, and I believe it's a picture of the Spirit of God who comes to where we are in sin and speaks to us, convincing us of of the power of Christ versus the power of sin and convinces us to come to Christ and draws us to Christ. That's what John 16, 17, 7-11 tell us. That surrounding clay tries to keep you down though. That shovel's dug in. He's trying to pull you up and you, I can't let go. 
So let's turn and look at something real quick. I'm um, go to John chapter three. Everybody's so familiar with John three sixteen. Let me read a little further this time. <clears throat> we all know that. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But let's read the, the rest of the story here. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, what He's saying there is that God didn't send His Son just to walk out to the clay and says, Y'all are pathetic. You're supposed to be fit for the Master's use. But you can't do anything on your own. I'm condemning all of you. That's not how it works. The condemnation is, is when, when Christ came into this world, He is the, He is the perfect example of fulfilling the law for us who cannot fulfill the law. And He does use the law to convict, but Christ is putting that shovel in and He's trying to dig you out. Amen? He's trying to tell you, I don't want you just to lay there and be condemned. I came to reach in there, put that spade in, and try to pull you up. Hey, girl, can you sit down? You, hey, can you sit down? You're distracting me and everybody in here. Thank you. But they're in there trying to pull that out of that clay. And that clay is holding on. I'm telling you, the devil will fight a good church in a minute, won't he? He'll fight a good church. That little girl probably thinks I hate her now. She don't know I love her, and that's why I'm telling her. The devil will fight a church in a minute. There's sinners in here that need to be saved. There's people that are listening that are sitting on the edge. There may be somebody here listening today that's about to kill theirself. And I know today was a hard day, and I know that there were some hard sayings, and I know some things are happening. But please understand, God's trying to do something and it's up to us to just love Him and let Him let Him have us on the wheel. Amen. Let Him have us and not us Him. But anyway, that, that process of, of, of this shovel going in and that clay tries to hold you down. Look as we go further in verse 18. He says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He's trying to say, hey, listen here. I'm trying to draw you up. You better listen to me. You better turn to me. You better let me have you. If you don't let me have you, you're condemned already with the rest of the mud. God put a flood on this place once before and destroyed it. He'll do it again, but it won't be by flood. We know that, right? It'd be by fire this time. Now watch this. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world. So, that's the shovel going in. That's the shovel digging in. By the way, I wonder if clay has feelings because that probably hurts. Oh! Right? The preaching typically hurts, doesn't it? Oh! Right? So, light has come into the world. I'm trying to pull you in, but look what happens. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. See what's going on here? God's trying to draw. God's trying to pull you out of the muck and mire. God's trying to make you a vessel fit for His service. He's trying to take you out of your own hands and put you in His hands and that you can live with Him forever and glorify Him forever. Amen? Sometimes as saved people, we think we're still clay. No, we're not. We're not clay. We may sin like we're still clay. We may fail like we're still clay. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're saved, God pulls you out of that mess. He puts you on the wheels. He starts to make you something for Himself. Amen? Don't ever look at yourself as... You know, I I get the idea of a sinner saved by grace. I get the idea of that because really that's, I guess, what we are. But when you got saved by grace, you're no longer a sinner. That's not how God views you. God views you as His child. God's pulled you out of the world. See, people hold on. He says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. People say, I don't want people to know what I do. We already know what you do. God already knows what you do. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, 
that his deeds may be made manifest that they are right in God. I'm going to tell you that's what repentance is. Is when God sticks that shovel in the Spirit of God and He's trying to pull you up out. And when it comes out, we're going to see all kind of rocks fall out of that and sticks and muck and mire and bugs and worms is all going to fall out of that. But when God leads you to repentance, that's exactly what you are in God's hands. You're in that spade and you're going, hey, this is my life. This is how horrible my life is. The only the only chance I have, the only hope I have is in the power of Jesus Christ to pull me on to those wheels. I can't do it myself. i got to get to that potter's house. Listen, if you're being dug out, give in to God. If you're being dug out, give in to God right now. Don't give in to the church. Don't give in to this preacher. Give in to God right now. He's the one doing the digging. It's not the preacher. Well, then the next thing he has is not only a shovel, but he has a mallet. A mallet. (laughs) Y'all thought I was going to say something like a comb or something. (laughs) It's a mallet. See, after the clay has been cleansed and processed, like we just talked about, it's placed on a table and beaten with a wooden mallet. The potter does this to knock out the air bubbles that might get trapped in the clay. He has to knock all them bubbles out. Because you know what happens when you try to set that thing up and work it and you fire it? Those air bubbles will make it unstable and it will explode in the furnace. Boy, that brings new meaning to therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, doesn't it? Amen. Anyway, I believe that is a wonderful picture of when you get saved, when you repent, when you get dug out of that clay and you give in to God, you're going to have a whole new set of trials that you did not have before. Because the lights come on. You know what I mean? The lights come on. You realize that now some of your actions are affecting others and, and you realize that the, the way you were going in your past life was a failure and, and you're trying to change things around. And that, they, that may blow up your household. That may mean you have to move churches now. That may mean you lose a job now. You know, bartenders that get saved, they don't stay bartenders. Amen? I'm a bartender for Jesus. Right? No, they don't. Because what happens is, is God starts pounding all the, the mess out of him. He starts pulling all this out. And the next thing you know, you're going to get a new set of trials. And that's the thing about brand new Christians. Some of you are newer than others. And I'm going to tell you, some of you are going through trials that, that you never had to experience before. Because now you're a Christian and you have to go through certain things. Some of you have been saved a little while, but you've been without a church and you didn't have a pastor that would lead and preach to you and love you. Maybe you joined in online. That is so in, in, insufficient, am I right? Amen. So insufficient. You can hear these messages all day long, sit over there online and go, go get them, preacher, preach it to them, and just sit over there and be the biggest Pharisee in the world. But you get in here into the house of God and you're saved and God's Spirit starts working and the preaching starts coming at you, you know what you do? You tend to let God have way. (laughs) Amen. Amen. That mallet, what a picture. That new set of trials you got. So then the next thing that happens is after he's pounded all that out, he puts you on the wheels. That mallet also may be a good picture of baptism. Because a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ typically means you have forsaken all the world's religions. That means the state religion. That means the religion that your mom and dad brought you up in. You become quite different. You start facing a trial that you never had before. You start getting pounded out a little bit, don't you? But then that's how you get on the wheel. It's like you get in the church through baptism. You get on the wheel through that pounding. Amen? Is this starting to sound vaguely familiar to what's happened to you in your life? Good, because if it hasn't, then you need to examine yourself and see if this has happened in your life. So the wheels. 
The way this works is there's a big, large bottom wheel, usually made of stone, um, that's, that, that has a little, uh, what do you call it, like a little edge in a socket where it can spin around on the bottom. And uh, what happens is, coming out of the larger stone is a shaft, and then on top of that is a smaller stone. And the potter will put you on that smaller stone, and then with his foot, he'll spin the bigger stone. So he, who's doing the work here? Boy, I need to get in the church so I can work. No, you don't. You need to get in so God can spin you. Not you spinning God. God's spinning you. I remember one of the first guys we rejected from baptism uh, was right after we made the vote to wait 90 days and that we were going to baptize everyone. And this guy came in, waited 90 days, and uh, the first thing that was held against him was when everybody turned to him and said, we're tired of hearing how you're going to change things when you get into this church. Y'all remember that day? Amen. Of course, he got shocked, and, and then by miraculous situation, he got saved 20 minutes later or something. You know how timing is everything. But uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't run the wheel. <laughs> the wheel runs you. Amen. Because who's in charge of that wheel? Is it Brother Sam? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I'm going to tell you, Brother Sam, we're in charge of this wheel. Let me tell you what Brother Sam likes to do. And my mother and my wife are both witnesses and know me better than anybody in this place. And I'm going to tell you right now what Brother Sam likes to do. Brother Sam likes to hide his head and hope it goes away. That's what I like to do. That that we did this morning, that young man needed that so bad. He needed that so much. He needed that. He needed that. His mom and daddy needed that. We needed that. But Brother Sam ain't going to run that. I'm going to tell you, Brother Sam don't like that. I don't like that kind of stuff. I'd rather just say, well, it'll go away. It'll, God will figure it out. I like to kind of take those scapegoats. I don't like to get in there and just preach it and stir it up and try to help people like that because I know that when I do, I, I feel like I'm just beating them half to death. But, but it's God. He's the one pushing that big wheel on the bottom. He's got that thing spinning just as fast as He wants. Why ain't our church spinning faster? Let's go to God with that. Amen? Why, why are the vessels not turning out the same? Let's go to God with that. That's what prayer is for. He's the one spinning the wheel. He's spinning it and He's got His hand on the clay sitting on that wheel because that clay turns. He's got to keep His hand on that clay because He's wanting to shape it up the way He wants to. And if He takes His hand off of it, it's going to fly off the wheel. In Christ, you'll never fly off the wheel. <laughs> Whoa. Did you know that circumstances shape you? You know, sometimes I've had to be confronted by men in this church by things I preach that weren't quite, or where did you get that from? That shaped me. Sometimes we, we have things that are not very comfortable. You know what that does? That shapes me. If someone comes and has odd against me, you know what, instead of me just bucking up and saying, get over it, maybe I ought to let that shape me. Because isn't that who God's going to use is us right here? It's exactly who He's going to use. Out of His love. And we'll never fly off that wheel. And He keeps that hand on us. So, and, and But let me tell you something. Circumstances shape you. Just like being on that wheel, circumstances sometimes come and it takes one bad turn after another. Right? Sometimes the potter may want to engrave something, etch it in. It just seems like these circumstances are killing me. But God controls the speed of that wheel. And we start to learn that all things work together for good to them that love God. Not to them that get along with the church. Not to them that are all happy with the pastor. But them that love God. And that's why the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. He's trying to tell us, you know what, Israel? You're like clay on that wheel. And I'm sitting here, I've got my hand on you and I'm trying to shape you. I'm going to exalt you. You were clay. You were filth, muck, mire. You stunk. But now I'm shaping you. 
I've got you on this wheel. I'm helping you. I'm shaping you. I'm working in you. And we say, but Lord, it hurts. But, but listen, I'm trying to do something with you. I'm trying to make you exalted. And he's telling us, don't be foolish. Even clay can't just jump off the wheel. Clay can't just say, oh, please don't etch me. Oh, please don't make me that color or that shape. God does it. And the clay is completely submitted in His hand. And you know how it got submitted in His hand? He made it that way. He dug it up. He pulled the rocks and sticks out. He watered, he let it harden up. Then he watered it down. And then he made a slip. And then he drained everything out of it that won't work. And then he set it up and let it cure. And he pounded it out with his feet. And then he set it up and let it cure some more. Then he pounded it out with a mallet. Then he put it on the wheel. And he's throwing water on that wheel. And he's spinning that wheel. And he's shaping you up. Listen, my friend, don't turn out from God. Don't say, this is too hard for me. This circumstance is too much for me. Don't turn away from God. Let Him have a hold of you. Just humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you in due time. Amen? He's trying to take you from clay to a vessel. So there's the wheels. Of course, that's why we lay hands on no man suddenly. I know we we like getting new life in the church. Amen? Every one of you families that have come uh, recently and, and all through, I can say that about every one of you. When you came in, it, it almost like brought new life. Every one of you that came in. Amen. You know, somebody else getting right with God. Praise the Lord. You know, it all brought new life in. And sometimes we'll look and go, man, these people are really on fire. And that's good. We need to be on fire. But I'm going to tell you something. Never lay hands on a man who has not been a few turns on that wheel. Amen? Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, I have, I, I'm not, I don't pretend to be like a great pastor, like I compare myself to someone else, because that would be just stupid. But I will tell you this, things that are going on with us today, that requires the help of of God's man and God's leader 20 years ago I couldn't handle. And I really and truly, I'll be honest with you men, I had no business being ordained in the ministry when I was and how I was. They ordained me because I was on fire for God and I was finishing Bible college and I had a calling in my life and they liked how I preached. Well, he preaches good. I used to preach good, and then I got right with God, and now I preach horrible. Amen. <laughs> but that didn't have any effect, and this does. I should not have had hands laid on me. And so, men, some of you may want to be used for God. Some of you may feel that you're being called, and so on. I say amen to that. Let's let God work that out because it's His will. You're His vessel. He'll work all that out. Brother Sam ain't going to put pressure on you. I'm not going to sit here and go, do you think you're called of God? You know, I think you're called of God. I think you ought to... No, no, no. God's going to do that because when a man's called, nobody can stop him. I'm going to tell you, Samson with the jawbone of an ass can't stop you. Amen? When you are called to preach. But before we lay hands on somebody, they're going to need to go around that wheel a few times. Amen? Because they're going to get out there and they're going to blow it apart. Well, here's my favorite implement. We got the shovel, we got the mallet, we got the wheels. But here's my favorite part, folks. And oh, I, oh, Spirit of God, may this come across the way I want it to. It's His hands. His hands are on me. See, the shovel can seem quite distant and the mallet can seem quite painful and those wheels can seem quite confusing. <laughs> but the whole time God's hand is on me. His hand is what makes the artwork. All these other things don't make the artwork. It's His hand. See, while the clay spins around on the wheels, 
It's never out of contact with His hands. He's in constant contact. He's molding. He's shaping. He's bringing the clay along through His loving guidance. Have you ever seen that on TV or ever seen somebody, like if you go to some parks and stuff, you'll see how they'll take this clay and shape it right on up and you think, how in the world do they do that? Because they're masters at it. That's how they do it. That's, that's why you like watching them, because they're so masterful at it. Or do you ever go and watch them blow glass? And then you think, how in the world did they take this hot element like this? I mean, sand turning to glass anyway is already a problem in my mind, but they take this and blow it up and it's colors and shapes and twisted and it's got artwork in the glass that looks identical to, a, to an image. How do they do that? Because they're masters. They're master artisans doing what God gave them the talent to do. What I want to tell you with God's hand on us and this church, you see, you're on the wheels, my friend. You're on the wheels. And sometimes you think, I don't like this etching. I don't like something being ducked down and having to be reformed. I, I don't like all that. But know this. It's from His mighty hand. It's from His hand. Therefore, the clay never gets out of shape. The clay never gets thrown off the wheel. It gets molded up to the Master's use. God is never away from us at all for any reason. Some of you may say, well, I've backslidden on God. I've gotten in sin in my life. Well, if you know that, then get right with God. We're going to talk about that a little bit more this afternoon. Get right with God. The feelings will come later. You ever just lost your pep in your step, lost your desire, go through a time of declension in your life? I have. Amen. A time where God is doing things, but you don't know He's doing things because it seems like everything's just dead. It seems like your prayers are bouncing off a brass ceiling. Amen. You ever go through that? We all do. We all do. But know this. It's a turn on the wheel. It's a turn on the wheel. That declension is not being put on a shelf or thrown off the wheel. That time of declension is God's hand still on you and it's a turn on the wheel that you may not understand right now. Amen? Amen. Boy, He loves us, don't He? We'll never spin out of control because He's always in touch. I guess the way to do it, what we're talking about here. His relationship with the clay. God is telling Israel, you're, you're, you're like clay, but they keep trying to jump off the wheel. See, they want to be their own vessel. But what they don't realize, they don't even have the influence within themselves to become a vessel. There's, without God, they'd still be over in the clay. So we need to reckon ourselves dead to the flesh. Reckon it today. You've been walking in the flesh, reckon yourselves dead. Remember your baptism? Notice when you read Romans chapter 7, he says, reckon yourselves to be alive unto God, dead to sin. Amen? That was a presentation. Your baptism was a presentation that showed what God's done for you. And just because you're on a turn on the wheel that you don't quite understand, God is turning you. God has got you going through this time of declension. He may have to show you who you really are because of your pride. He may have to show you how low you can fall because of your pride. Maybe He has to take you through some things to show you uh, what you will do when you're pressed. Maybe He does it for you to have more confidence in Him. I don't know, but God's in control. She's saying, Brother Sam, I'm in a time of declension. But, and you know what I mean. It's more than coming to church. It's more than street preaching. It's more than these things we do on the outside. It's a real walk with God. And we may be on the wheel and it may be cold. Remember this. It's a turn on the wheel. And God has the wheel. And God has you. Let God show you what He's showing you and get back swiftly. Let Him let Him turn you and reckon yourselves to be dead to your flesh, your pride, your conveniences your worldly comforts. Allow His life, 
His character molds you. Stay on the wheel. Stay on the wheel. Every vessel that comes from a potter had its own signature. And the experts could look at it and go, oh, that's of this whatever. You ever see that antique shows or whatever? Um, I don't watch them, but every now and then I happen to go to mom's house. There's one on. And they'll, or, or I'll go to a clinic and you'll see it on. And this guy will say, well, this is Ming Dynasty, whatever. This is over here, this. How do you know that? Because it all had its own signature. So really, to be honest, I mean, think about a nice vase, a big old vase or an urn that's Ming Dynasty. Do they ever go, look at this vase? This vase is worth something. Why? Because it's pretty. Nope. It is pretty. But why is it worth something? Because it's of the Ming Dynasty. Because of the ones who made it. That's what I'm trying to tell you today. And that's why I didn't preach the whole Potter sermon, because we'd be here another two hours. We need to hear this. Amen? Reckon yourselves dead and stay on the wheel. Jesus said, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Amen. I'm on the wheel this morning. I'm on the wheel. I'm not on a fence. I'm on the wheel. Amen. God's got me on the wheel. And He's spinning it around. He's molding me. His hand's on me. And I'm going to try to tell you, He's got the same with you. And He'll bless your life today. So today, listen to me. If God's trying to dig you out, get dug out. Get dug out. Let Him have you. That's all salvation is. Is It goes from I'm going this way to start obeying, obeying God because I believe He is and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Amen. I'm going along like this and I'm in sin. And all of a sudden I hear about God and His gospel and realize I need to obey God. <laughs> You're His. Get on the wheels. Amen. Let Him pound you out and put you on the wheels. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stop right there. God bless you. Thank you.